to byla domácí verze rock and roll. So that was a, a home version of rock and roll. Uh, Pavla Johnson is a translator and a university professor and she will host the first discussion. Please join me here and we can introduce the debate together. Pavla Johnson and you can continue giving her a big applause. It's always good. So please, could you introduce Germaine Greer uh, in your own words so that we can start the debate? What does she represent for you in Czech or in English? Well, everybody has headsets. And please give them back when uh, when you're leaving. And yesterday we had only one <laughs> headset that was stolen. So for us, for the Czechs, we have only one work by Germaine Green from 1970, which uh, was translated uh, in 2001. It's called The Female Eunuch. And I had the honor to translate this book. It is a classic of the second wave uh, feminism. And we knew that Germaine Greer is a publicly active intellectual who is able to lead debates about practically anything and has original ideas. And so it is really a pleasure to join her uh, world of ideas. And we will have the honor to meet Germaine Greer in person tonight. Germaine Greer. Germaine Greer, born in Melbourne, Australia, ranks among the most notable intellectuals of our times. Her views have raised controversy since the first text she published, The Female Eunuch, which came out in Czech translation in 2001 and now in a new edition on the occasion of her current visit. Her other books also explored her favorite topics of feminism and sexuality. Among others, she wrote about the role of women in Shakespeare's work. Read. Oh, do you? Oh. <laughs> so my job is to read to you today. I don't usually read when I have the audience before me. Because if I hold up my paper, I don't communicate with you anymore. Uh, in fact, I am shielded from you by my paper. Also, what I'm going to read to you is difficult. And I'm not going to apologize for it, but I will explain it a bit because it hasn't been very well understood. For years, I was aware that it wasn't true that the obsession of fine art was with the naked body of women, because it wasn't. Michelangelo, Michelangelo, for example, probably never saw a naked woman. All of his women are built on the bodies of men, rather boys. Now, a boy is a special creature. He is wicked. He is not yet brought in under the corporate control of the masculine world. And he's an adventurer. And he comes in all shapes and sizes. But the important thing about him is that he is young. And he won't be young for very long. As soon as his beard comes in, his cheeks cave in, his beauty is gone, like the beauty of a spring flower. And his mother probably adores that beauty, her beautiful son, and she loses him before he grows up, when he turns into a man, which is a different creature, and as we have discussed elsewhere, is really caught up in the corporate world of men, which becomes important to him. Now, the Guardian decided 
that what I was doing was, um, what did they say? I was objectifying men. Objectify is one of those nonsense words that got invented when everyone was in a hurry. And they thought that what I was saying, I was trying to turn boys into sex objects. Well, no one was waiting for me to do that. Boys had been sex objects forever. Um, but the interesting thing for me was, you have boys who are incredibly beautiful, transcendentally beautiful, in all sorts of different manifestations. So you have Eros, a young boy, uh, a young boy who would seduce his mother, if he could. Uh, you have angels, and angels have been tricky from the beginning. Some people wanted them to be sexless, but that didn't work. And then for a while they were female, that didn't work either. Then they became boys, and then everyone knew what to do with them. Uh, so you can then go to the boy soldier, to the sleeping boy, the vulnerable boy, and so I put together a book of pictures. And I should really be showing you the pictures because I'm going to talk to you about them. And it won't make very much sense if you don't get to see them. And I'd like to say that you probably know these pictures, but I'm afraid you probably don't. So forgive me. If I'd had a bit more leisure, I would have put together a video show for you. But Again, we have all kinds of mythical figures and so on. We have Saint Sebastian, the gorgeous Saint Sebastian. What is the most important thing about him? His body is perforated, it's pierced. And if you think of Titian's Sebastian in the Basilica in Venice, he's absolutely gorgeous. And they used to say things like that the women would kneel in front of this image and in the end, they had to make them go to another chapel that didn't have this stimulus of this beautiful creature with his burning eyes and his beautiful flat belly and broad shoulders and the knot at his groin, which is where his drapery was attached, which looked strangely like genitals, but was pure. And to the pure of heart, all things are pure. But to the desirous and the lonely, that's not true. So I'll read you the beginning of the last chapter of this book, uh, which is called The Female Gaze. And that's because, <laughs> in my innocence, I really hoped that women would buy the book and allow themselves to enjoy the images of irresistible boys. Oh, they didn't. The people who bought the book were gay men. And when I was at literary festivals, the queue would go round the block, and the gay men bought them a dozen at a time and distributed them to all their friends, which was fine with me, except that their eyes were already aware of the beauty of boys. And it was the pleasure for women, because we know how beautiful our sons are. We know how our hearts ache when they start shaving and we realize that it's all coming to an end, the baby time. Anyway, so let me have a go at this and I'll try and explain as I go along. Um, and I don't want you to feel that you have to ask me, you know, who was Endymion? Because it would be very boring if I really <laughs> tried to answer. He was a shepherd boy who was asleep in the stars with his dog and the best sculptures have boy and dog and the moon, Diana, who is in love with him and who is no more a virgin than most of us. Anyway, here we go. The female gaze. In 1620 or thereabouts, Giovanni Lanfranco painted an oddly suggestive picture of a young man. He was naked except for a strip of cloth thrown lightly over his loins, lying propped up on his left elbow on a crumpled bed, 
smiling at the viewer over his right shoulder as his right hand stretches back across his body to caress an adoring black and white cat. The boy is beardless, his body slim, lightly muscled and hairless. The concealing of his genitals suggests that they are unfit to be shown. Tumescent, perhaps. You never know with these boys. While the effect of intimacy is heightened by the perspective because you're actually looking downwards into a bed. The boy's knees are slightly drawn up, his back tense and twisted, in a version of the pose of St. Lawrence, reacting to the heat of the gridiron in paintings of his martyrdom. But in this case, only cool white sheets lie under him and all the heat is in his eyes. Now, very few women write about this kind of thing, so Edward Lucy Smith, who writes about the body in art, writing of this picture in 1972, assumed that the painter was painting someone like himself to be viewed by someone like himself. Equally, this is Lucy Smith, equally narcissistic in feeling is the painting of Young Boy on a Bed by Lanfranco. The boy himself appears to be a self-portrait of the artist. Not, <laughs> they do this sort of thing all the time. Not only because the face resembles other known portraits, i.e. it's got eyes, a nose, and a mouth, um, but because the picture was fairly obviously painted with the help of a mirror. Something which gives a rather different complexion to what might first seem an unusually candid example of a homosexual representation. You might as well say it's bestiality, it's about cat fucking, but of course it isn't. Um, but this is what happens when people interpret paintings. They generally have an agenda. But here am I trying to enliven the female agenda. When you look at this picture, what, what do you like about it? The painting certainly suggests a sexual context, but just as Lucy Smith's hypothetical narcissism um, depended on a mistaken assumption about the painter, the homosexuality hypothesis depends upon an assumption about the viewer. Lucy Smith may not have known that within 30 years of its being painted, this picture was acquired by Queen Christina of Sweden. In 1656, when Christina took up her abode in the Palazzo Farnese in Rome, she chose as her private apartment one that opened off the great gallery, which the Caracci brothers had sumptuously decorated with a series of paintings of the triumph of love, featuring such classic tales of female desire as Diana and Endymion, and Aurora and Cephalus. Christina had brought with her as her secretary, Gabriel Gilbert, already the author of a tragedy on Hippolytus. And those of you who know your mythology know that Hippolytus's mother in, well, mother-in-law, father's second wife, uh, that she fell in love with him and he was eventually torn to pieces by the horses of desire. It's, and it's the Phaedra story. You would have read it when you did your Racine. Don't look at me blankly. You know who Racine is. Anyway, so there she is on her great gallery. And she had commissioned from her secretary a new tragedy of thwarted female desire called Les Amours de Diane et d'Endymion which had just been performed in Paris. According to some eyewitnesses, she liked to read after dinner to her guests from Gilbert's Pastoral Héroïque, 
and in particular the speeches in which the goddess declares her love for the sleeping shepherd boy. Now, Christina, as you probably know, was in very poor health and had no access to fleshly delights. The words printed here, it says fleshy delights, but in fact it meant fleshly delights. Uh, but she was an enthusiastic patron of poetry, music, theatre, dance, and painting. And she greatly embarrassed her staff in the Palazzo Farnese by going around and removing the fig leaves from the male figures in the palace collection. And you could hardly blame her, could you really? But that's, <laughs> that's what she did. 30 years after Gilbert wrote Les Amours de Diane et d'Endymion for her, she was still so fascinated by that theme of, the, of the, the stellar boy and the lustful goddess of chastity, the moon, and childbirth, rather discouraging in the circumstances. She was still so fascinated by the theme that she collaborated with Alessandro Guidi on an Italian verse pastoral called Endimione that was published after her death as by Erilo Cleoneo, actually by her. The exposition of her Lanfranco was part and parcel of Christina's conscious and deliberate campaign to reclaim female desire. She also acquired Rubens's opulent and ambiguous rendition of the dying Adonis. And I don't have to remind you that that's another irresistible boy. And that Shakespeare wrote a poem about poor old Venus trying to get him to cooperate and him being all virginal and uncooperative until in the end, of course, he's gored to death by a boar which is sent by Mars, who is jealous. Nicodemus Tessin the Younger, who saw the Rubens, the Rubens is the most beautiful painting, um, who, where am I, um, also noticed a Ganymede, and he was cupbearer to the gods, another gorgeous boy, carried off by an eagle, you'll remember. Uh, Michelangelo's famous cartoon of Venus and Cupid, which inspired many versions. He never actually worked it into a full painting, but all his disciples did. It was almost like a necessary um, training for them. And it was for many years displayed in the Farnese Palace, along with the painting from it that is now in Capodimonte in Naples. Garofalo Saint Sebastian, also now in Capo, in Capo di Monte, which hung in the second sala of the Quadreria, may also have been to Christina's taste. Christina also owned the Dura panels of Adam and Eve that show Adam unusually as an Apollo type nude. And you know that, you must know that picture. The example of Christina cannot be said to clinch the argument that women are likely to be at least as aware of and responsive to the charms of a boy as men are. But it's important to remember that Christina was one of the very few women who was not obliged to conceal their real feelings under the cloak of modesty. What she could do openly other women could do privately. And you're probably aware that there's, I think it's actually a, a television film of, Chris, of uh, Catherine the Great with Helen Mirren. If they leave out the pornography, I shall be really disappointed. It's, I'm not very confident about the film because I've heard it, at least one quotation which is entirely wrong. Um, but we'll see. It, it would please me, these powerful women with, with heterosexual taste did come to the fore and did, were able to um, establish an agenda for women who would like to have an educated gaze. Now, Margaret Walters, who I was at school with at Melbourne University, says in The Nude Man, 
that up to the 19th century, men took it for granted that women have a sensuous response to male beauty. Now, Ovid certainly took that for granted, and you remember that Ovid is the, the source of a huge amounts of European literature. Um, you, your beauty has captured my heart, says the hapless Phaedra to Hippolytus, whom we've already mentioned. To say no more, my eyes delight in whatsoever you do, she says. Medea was consumed by desire at the very sight of Jason. I saw you, and I was undone. Sappho, too, was betrayed by her eyes. Now, <laughs> this quotation is no more by Sappho than I am, or this is, uh, but it, it's part of the package that you get. Sappho it died for love of a man, died of... of um, unsatisfied desire, flung herself off the Leucadian rock, uh, none of which is true, really. But it's part of our story, part of the great lie. Sappho, too, is betrayed by her eyes. You have beauty, and your years are apt for life's delights. O oh, beauty that lay in ambush for my eyes. Helen doesn't doubt that any woman who saw him would fancy Paris. Your beauty, too, I confess, is rare, and a woman might well wish to submit to your embrace, she says. When Phaedra woos her obdurate stepson, she reminds him of the other, of the goddesses, heavens, see the mind police are already moving in. She, rem she reminds him of goddesses who were seduced by the sight of a boy's healthy beauty, of Aurora, leaving her old husband, Tithonus, to lie with the shepherd boy, Cephalus, of Venus, panting for Adonis. The nymph Echo had only to see Narcissus, and her fate was sealed. It could be argued that these examples represent nothing more than male fantasies about female arousal. If both men and women had not found the circumstances thoroughly believable. There are examples too from Holy Writ. Remember Potiphar's wife? Had but, <laughs> there's a funny misprint here, who had but to cast her eyes upon 17-year-old Joseph who was a goodly person and well-favoured, to desire him so ardently that she importuned him daily and ultimately grabbed his garment and tried to drag him into bed. And it's one of the few sculptures by a woman that shows Joseph and Potiphar's wife by Properzo de Rossi in Bologna. The hellfire preacher, Savonarola, persuaded his 15th century Florentine followers that in houses where there are young girls, it is not right to keep painted figures of naked men and women. Among the penitents who followed him was the painter Fra Bartolomeo, who brought all his nude studies and paintings to be publicly burnt. When it was said of Fra Bartolomeo later, that he could not paint the naked human figure, he took up the challenge, and he used our old favorite. He did a picture of Saint Sebastian, naked, very realistic in coloring of his flesh, who has an air of great charm. He's just been shot to death with arrows, but he has a great, an air of great charm, and whose body was likewise executed with corresponding beauty. This won him endless praise among the craftsmen. It was said that when this painting was put on show in the church, after the women had, after the friars had found women in confession, who on looking at it had sinned through the captivating and sensuous resemblance of a living figure given to it by Fra Bartolomeo's talent, they removed it from the church. In 1657, so we're all in the same area, in 1657 or so, the nuns of the Church of St. Sebastian in Naples commissioned a Sebastian from Mattia Preti only to reject it 
ostensibly because the figure was without that nobility and beauty that are appropriate to a noble body, and that the face was more like that of a street porter than a captain of soldiers, as St. Sebastian was. So you know who they fancied. The delivery man was a more likely object of their passion. Insights into women's patronage of the arts tend to be fitful and misleading. The fact that Isabella d'Este, the 16-year-old bride of Francesco Gonzaga, had no sooner taken possession of her private apartment in the Palazzo Ducale in Mantua in 1490 than she set about commissioning large-scale allegorical paintings by Perugino, Mantegna, Lorenzo Costa, and Correggio all of which showed nudes of both sexes. Now that's usually interpreted as evidence of the influence of her humanist suitors, uh, tutors. Yet Isabella was the daughter of one female connoisseur, connoisseur Eleonora of Aragon, and sister-in-law of another, the Duchess of Urbino, both of whom commissioned secular works from the best paintings of painters of their generation for their private apartments. Certainly, Isabella was understood to be capable of sophisticated visual pleasure. By the 1620s, when Elizabeth de Bourbon wished to visit her husband, Philip IV, in his summer apartments, where the famous Titian Poesie were hung, she would ask that these fabulously sensual paintings be covered up in advance of her arrival. Catherine the Great accumulated the greatest art collection of any European monarch, but most of it was bought in bulk by agents who had no opportunity to assess her preference. Legend has it that the boudoir in her pa palaces were decorated with images of young men that were not so much erotic as pornographic. Now, more reliable evidence, perhaps, of female response to the beauties of boys may be derived from women's writing. Sylvia, the sister in Afrobend's novel Love Letters Between a Nobleman and His Sister, actually his sister-in-law, have her tell her brother-in-law, you are beautiful as heaven itself can render you, a shape exactly formed, not too low or too tall, but made to beget soft desire and everlasting wishes in all that look on you. But your face, your lovely face, inclining to round, large, piercing black eyes, delicate proportioned nose, charming dimpled mouth, plump red lips inviting and swelling, white teeth, small and even, fine complexion, and a beautiful turn, all which you had an art to order in so engaging a manner that it charmed all beholders. Both sexes were undone with looking on you. When Sylvia decides to cons consummate her affair with Philander, her justification is that her forces are too weak to withstand his shock of beauties, that he has charms enough to justify her yielding, that she is a virgin quite disarmed by two fair eyes, an angel's voice and form. Ben's women, by whom I mean Afra Ben, and the portrait you will know of Afra Ben, just to, just to amuse you if you like, is actually a distorted picture of Christina of Sweden. So we come back to the great female lectures. They form an interesting club. Now, Ben's women aren't simply aware of male beauty. They actively seek it. Their gaze will lock onto the charms of young men, even when they are hidden. Miranda, the anti-heroine of Ben's story, The Fair Jilt, loses her heart in church when a young Franciscan friar offers her the collection box. She takes a look at his hand, and she's done for. She beheld him steadfastly and saw in his face all the charms of youth, wit, and beauty. 
He wanted no one grace that could form him for love. He appeared all that is adorable to the fair sex. Nor could the misshapen habit hide from her the lovely shape it endeavoured to cover her, nor those delicate hands that approached her too near with the box. She gazed upon him while he bowed before her and waited for her charity till she perceived the lovely friar to blush and cast his eyes upon the ground. Not exactly that, his gaze upon the ground. Uh, she gave him a pistole, but that with so much deliberation and leisure as easily betrayed the satisfaction she had in looking on him. Sleepless in bed, she fantasizes that the young friar puts off religion and exchanges his habit for a thousand dalliances for which his youth was made. For love, for tender embraces, and all the happinesses of life. Every day, her passion takes new fire from his eyes. She tries to seduce him, begging, do that which thy youth and beauty were ordained to do. All ends, as you might expect, in tears. to take the applause for Afra Ben and Christina of Sweden. Yeah. Uh, I think they'll appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you so much for such a refreshing contribution to our topic of how the beauty will save the world. It brings in all these, all what is taught in gender classes, John Berger's ways of seeing, and Laura Malvi, the male gaze, and you're kind of really radically uh, turn it upside down and come up with a with a with a completely opposite strategy how to how to interpret uh, what what is happening what the psychologists say that women go out into a public space to be seen and men go out to see so you're basically challenging all, all this, uh, all of that. And, and like my question would be, like I was always surprised that you kind of kept teaching literature and that you didn't kind of um, do feminist theory or gender studies courses where you would develop your own uh, your own theory like, like this one. <laughs> Well, it's interesting you should say that because, of course, um, I was teaching in a university and we ha I, for years I taught female history. I wanted oh, to did. know what women were doing. Um, so I needed to, I wrote, I've written a book recently about Shakespeare's wife where I tried to unite the social history of how women made a living because he left her with newborn twins and a toddler and a living to earn. So what did she do? She must have done something. Um, and I thought also she let him go. Why do I think that? Because in fact the parish could have called him back again if he left the children unsupported. So they weren't. I don't know how she did it but I've suggested she was a trader. She was a sole trader in her own name making a living probably in connection with haberdashery, which was very closely connected to the theater, and one of Shakespeare's brothers was a haberdasher. So mm -hmm. it's all ordinary stuff. You know, it's, it's daily business without having to um, erect fantastic proposals about this, that, and the other. Um, and I really needed to know, did women were women susceptible to the beauty of boys? We certainly know that men were, but we also know that boys used to exploit it. If you were a very good-looking boy, you got a job as a page. And if you, your uh, employer, if he could see that you were gorgeous and you could sing or you could play an instrument or you were funny, 
he would sell you to somebody else. And you could actually go right up the social scale just because you were a gorgeous boy. Um, and the boys knew how to exploit that. And what the women used to do, they played all sorts of games with these boys. They used to dress them up in their own clothes. And in fact, the male actors in Shakespeare's theatre, the ladies would collect them after the play in their coaches and play with them in the coach. Um, and that involved undressing and dressing and, and sex play and fun. Um, so it's... But the boy is also... Uh, a dangerous character. He can embroil people um, and he's manipulative because that's all he's got is his precarious position. Mm -hmm. So there was I struggling away, reading manuscripts, collecting um, photocopies of manuscripts and publishing a whole book of the poetry of women of the 17th century mm -hmm. in England. Um, and that was the way I wanted to go. I, I wanted to get more and better information about the women of the past. And there was very little in their own hands, was, but there was something, uh, a bit. But then, into my life came gender. I'd no sooner you know, got the Tulsa Center for the Study of Women's Literature set up and we had our own magazine and all of that, then suddenly we weren't allowed to talk about that anymore because it became gender studies. And frankly, at that point, um, I, d I didn't really want to work on masculinity, and how, which I think is even more demanding than femininity. I think it's a cruel discipline. And I think lots of men find it really painful and, and flee it, really. Just want to find a, a different way of life, which doesn't mean you're forever having to prove yourself against other people and you can't cry and, you, and you've got to get your mother's milk out of you uh, because it makes you soppy and all that kind of stuff. It wasn't quite as bad as that, but it was pretty bad. And then you put in the jockocracy in as well because everybody's playing a sport. And that means you have to be tough and cruel. <laughs> Uh, so that suddenly became a thing where we spent more time thinking about the, f the formation of gender distinctions and gender fantasies uh, than we did about questions like, uh, a woman has five children and they all die in infancy. Does she take it in her stride? Because there were people who wrote social histories that said they were used to it, they got over it. Mm -hmm. Not true at all. The commonest cause of melancholia was child death for both parents, but the mother sometimes just didn't even recover. Um, and I think we made a big contribution, and I know that our book is still being used in where people do women's history. But I, I realized after a while that I loved finding my women I loved finding their bits of paper. Uh, there's Anne Finch, Countess of Winchelsea, whose husband said that every piece of paper with her writing on had to be destroyed. So imagine how I felt in the Southampton Record Office when I found one little piece of paper with her writing on it. And it was lovely, old-fashioned, beautiful handwriting from 1680 or so. So that's what we did. But it became less and less fashionable. But it's still there. And I'm hoping that instead of forever getting involved in feminist theory, I mean, this is very funny. Most of my students were feminists, mm -hmm. but there was one thing they hated like poison, and that was feminist theory. Because they, they knew what their lives were like, and they were looking for ways of describing it, mm -hmm. but then they suddenly had right ways and wrong ways mm -hmm. of describing it, and they reacted as anybody would. But, and it became very dogmatic, and you could get it wrong. And here we were groping for our own language, and suddenly there are people saying, you can't use this word and you must use that word. And, and, and I'm, I remember t I taught a whole class on the body, which was all about how our bodies are socialized, about things like tattoos and where you put them. And, and we had great fun with that. Uh, but it was in the sociology school and the next thing we saw was that sociology threw it out. They didn't want to teach it, so it just went bang, it was gone. 
And now I'm not, I'm not even sure how they're doing it now. I've yeah. sort of given up on the whole, the whole uh, project. Mm -hmm. But I'm still interested in women's own witness about what it's like to bury your children, mm -hmm. one after the other, um, and what it's like to have a husband who has the power of life and death over you, and what it's like to not be able to contact your family, and about very obvious things like domestic violence. Yeah. It's all there, but I think you have to listen to the authentic voice of the women telling you about it. Thank you. Uh, I, I would like to return to the female gaze because it's, it's a really provocative, fascinating topic. But the main kind of thing which is interesting for us Czech people here, having you here, is that, that uh, we were so deprived of what was happening, all these intellectual streams like feminism. And so, so here we have the translation of your, of your influential book. And um, it, we would really like to know more, what was it like for you? Was there a sisterhood, solidarity among the, the feminist thinkers? Uh, what, what was it like when you wrote the book um, in 1970? 69, actually. 69. What was it like? There were really basic questions that are still there, like, is it an advance or a retreat when women join the army and apply to carry weapons and fight in the front line, which is happening? And to my, I'm an old-fashioned anarchist. For me, a soldier is the least free person on earth. He can't have his own morality. He can't make up his own mind about who the enemy is. Um, and he has to do things which are quite clearly wrong. Um, and I was sort of very primo piano. You're working at this level. And really... I didn't shrink so much from academic feminism, but we were ending up with literally miles of books in libraries, and yet nothing was changing on the ground. Women were still not being properly paid, they were still being abused, uh, we still had a, a wages gap, we still have a wages gap, and things that are really important that should have been changed didn't get changed at all, because we were suddenly caught up in this abstract discourse and these abstract um, arguments which were a bit like the old arguments about how many angels will fit on the head of a pin. And you had to say, well, as I don't believe in angels, I don't care how many angels fit on the head of a pin. So we were looking for um, abstract statements, principles, before we'd actually understood where the shoe pinched. So we're still limping. Mm -hmm. but, and we're not actually able to engage with the conditions on the... We, in those days, you know, women couldn't even, in many places, couldn't even have a bank account. They couldn't even run their own affairs. Uh, whereas, and here am I thinking, Shakespeare's wife was a businesswoman, and I'm pretty sure she was. So, like that. Mm -hmm. And I still do it. And I'm still, you know, I've still got an edition of Anne Finch, Countess of Winchelsea, that is... It's be, another one is being published by Oxford University Press, but they're having a terrible time with it because they keep announcing a delay, and I'm waiting, crouching in the wings mm -hmm. to sort of pounce on their mistakes, which they're bound to have made. Mm -hmm. Because it's a difficult case, that one. But I, I kind of was imagining the feminist second wave as that, the, that these uh, intellectual women were communicating, that they were together, they were corresponding, meeting at conferences, that they were friends, that there was some kind of sisterhood, no? <laughs> um, uh, sisters are quite tricky relations, you know. I mean, I love my sister more than anyone else on earth. But when I started to work in the rainforest, my sister is a botanist. And in my innocence, I thought, we, we will have this to talk about. And uh, she will have someone who understands where she's coming from, and I will learn from her. 
You know what she thought? She thought I was competing with her. The last thing I meant, and I don't dream of it, she's a proper botanist, I'm not, and everything I know about botany she taught me. But there was this distrust, which is gone now, I think, because we're older and you do get smarter. It's true, it's not true what they say. <laughs> you get a bit smarter, so, and I, but we, it, they were always problematic relationships. You know, we had uh, women who thought they were leaders, like Betty Friedan. And every time, every time I was on a speaking platform with, with Betty, she would say, Jermaine would say, blah, 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 and all this stuff about what I would say, but I never got to say it, because she used up all my time and then talked about what, she, and she'd say, you know, a chicken in every pot. She'd say to women who'd never eaten a chicken. And I'd sort of sit there thinking, will I get, I remember when we were in Iran, I wanted to talk to the, uh, the women who wore the chador, the Islamic Marxists from the university. This was only months before the fall of the Shah. It was a really exciting time. And it took me ages to set up a meeting because we were surrounded by Savak, by the secret police. <laughs> I'd no sooner got it organized than Betty came into my room in a very elaborate negligee with big flounces that flapped mm -hmm. up and down, and she said, what's this about going to the University of Isfahan? I don't want to go there. I don't want to talk to these people. They didn't, they didn't consult me about this. And I'm thinking, that's my visit. That's my visit. Please don't come. Please don't come and talk about chickens in pots, please. And in fact, she didn't come, thank God. But that was, I mean, that was one thing. I, the, the National Organization for Women really wanted more women in the House of Representatives in America. And I couldn't see that it would make any difference because you get the women that are available. Um, and what, what would happen in England is that you could fill the house with Tory women in hats and cut glass accents who were completely right wing. Um, and it wouldn't change anything. That, it, that's not enough, especially. And I thought it was funny that people thought you could be a feminist and a Republican in America. They used to <laughs> make me laugh because it seemed to me absurd. Um, so there was that. I, they tried to adopt me and I had to make sure they didn't get the chance. Um, in England, everything was a bit more backward, maybe. And we marched about things like abortion, which used to get me down because we got to a point where we seemed to be thinking that abortion was a privilege. And I thought of it as a sad duty that you do because you're going to lose your university place or lose your lodgings or lose your boyfriend or break your parents' heart. Um, and you put yourself through this ordeal because you actually didn't have a choice. There wasn't another option. And so when it was presented as freedom, it used to make me really cross. And in fact, I think it still does because we still haven't... We still haven't made a situation where you can make a free choice as a young woman at, at university and, or, or wherever to actually have your baby. Every baby born should have a guaranteed income. Yeah. Well, the, the, the terrible thing is that, that we have to end, but and I have <laughs> I hoped that I can ask you so many other things, but just maybe last thing. So, from behind the Iron Curtain, I thought the feminist movement would bring this new ethics of non-hierarchical um, communication. And then I read the book by Faye Weldon, The Big Women, which kind of shows like a disastrous ending. Is, is that also how you feel about the second wave of feminism? No, not at all. Because the thing that has changed uh, is women themselves, they are different. And there you are, unhappy, um, you've done all the things you're supposed to do, you're married to a perfectly nice man who earns a decent living and you've got clever children who are going to school and being nice and not using drugs and da 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 and your heart is breaking. Mm -hmm. And so you lift up your head and you sniff the air 
and it smells of freedom. Mm -hmm. And you go for it. And you end up living in poverty, holding down a job, looking after the kids, trying to exist on a, on a pittance of money, uh, probably exhausted, not even very well. Uh, in, when you have babies, you're the bottom of the, of the queue. You know, you are, everybody tells you what to do and how to do it, but they don't ask you what your wishes are. And you get used to that. You get used to being lonely. You get used to having no holidays because you can't afford them. You have no clothes. And then the kids start giving you the usual malarkey that they give when they get older. And all the time you're trying to keep an even keel, keep everything going, and you get to the, the point where uh, I'm so thrilled when I see women sitting in my audience with their daughters, with their 25-year-old, 30-year-old, 40-year-old daughters, and they are still together. The girls understand, the women understand what their mothers went through and why they went through it. And these are women who have smelt freedom and who are determined that they will not go into an ignoble life of making do and putting up with things. They're just not going to. They're outspoken, they're uh, mentally stimulated, they're alive in a way that they were never alive before. And I just love it because it is all changing. But it's changing there. It's not changing at the level of macro politics because it's still the same bullshit. But underneath you have these women who have smelt freedom and who are not going back into servitude and who will face all the contradictions in their relationships and come through it. And I just, I look at them and I just think they're fantastic. And it's nothing to do with me. They made the female eunuch, you know, I didn't. It's not a very good book. It's not my best book. Um, they're the ones who picked it up and read it and supplied its deficiencies from their own experience. And they are the real authors of that book. Cool. Thank you.